Hey, John Gard here, and I'm uh, joined by champion plowman David Gard, who's going to help me today talk about plow hitching. Uh, we're working with a trailer plow today, but the physics and the fundamentals that uh, I'll show apply to all plow types, uh, whether it's a garden tractor sleeve hitch type plow or a semi mount plow or a three point mounted plow. So, the gap I see in uh, instruction and in understanding moldboard plows is you can read all the manuals you want and, set, and spend a bunch of time in the shop setting up the tractor and plow just perfect. But when you get to the field and it doesn't do what you want, do you know how to correct it? So in this video, I'll explain the physics behind the moldboard plow. And if you don't understand the physics, hopefully you'll be able to recognize what the plow is not doing correctly in the field and know how to correct it. Because field conditions can be variable. The draft force of the tractor can change, the soil force and the plow can change, and you need to be able to know how to adjust for that. So we'll start out with something I see at plow days quite often. The plow shears are wore out. They may have no suck at all, or maybe the cutting edge has quite a sled runner underneath it. And the plowman will instinctively raise the plow hitch trying to get the plow to go on the ground. The problem there is uh, it works. It gets the plow on the ground, but now it's running on its nose. And what that means is the plow is being supported by the sled runner underneath the shear and not the wheels or the support mechanism like a landside heel that is meant to support the plow. So it's not a stable system because now that you're running on your nose and the plow is supported by that sled runner, what happens when you hit a soft piece of ground? Now it's gonna to sink to China and you hit a hard piece of ground, now it's gonna come back up again. The second part of that is the plow's running on its nose, the land sides are not in the ground to support the plow, so it's going to pull crooked, and it's going to pull towards the unplowed ground. So now the plowman will move the tractor and plow hitch over to the right to compensate for that, and he just makes a mess of things. To understand the physics of the moldboard plow, we'll start with a force vector, which represents a force acting on a body. The vector defines the magnitude of the force represented by the length of the arrow and the direction of the force. In this diagram, force F is acting on this imaginary particle out in space represented by this red dot. So let's look at a plow from the side view. The soil forces on the individual plow bottoms are added up and represented by the soil force vector. The location, orientation, and magnitude are all important and are represented by this vector. The weight of the plow is represented by the weight vector. Doing some graphical vector addition using the parallelogram rule, we find the resultant vector, which is the addition of the soil force and the weight of the plow. We'll call it vector SW. Now, the line of pull is determined by the orientation of the plow drawbar. The pull force always falls on this line. Where the pull force and vector SW intersect determines where the wheel force vector is located. Doing some vector addition again, we can find the magnitude of the wheel force and the pull force. The wheel force is the force left over that the wheels have to support, and its location front to rear determines how the force is shared between the front and rear wheels. The location of this wheel force is important. The goal is to get the pull force to intersect where the soil force and the weight force intersect. Why? Because the soil force will vary. It will rotate up and down, but it will always intersect the weight force in about the same spot. <clears throat> so if the pull force intersects the resultant vector SW in that same spot, the wheel force will not move forward or back, which is neat to think about because that means the ground can get hard the wheel force could approach zero, and if the force is balanced between the front and back wheels, you would never notice it. The plow would run perfect and steady. So here is an example of an ideal vertical hitch adjustment. The plow is running steady front to back. It's maintaining a consistent depth. It's turning consistent furrows. The tailwheel linkage is not bobbing around. The tailwheel looks planted in the ground. So on a plow like this, it's easy to see from the seat of the tractor if the tailwheel linkage is flopping around. On a plow with a rigid tailwheel or a rolling landside, it's a lot harder to see that from the seat of the tractor. 
So I'll have a friend drive the tractor and I'll walk along behind the plow and try to grab the tail wheel to try to gauge how much weight is on that tail wheel. Now be careful if the tail wheel is like a steel tail wheel, don't get your hand cut. So here's my theory on an antique contest plow hitch adjustment. I always adjust the plow hitch as low as possible on the plow. The only reason to raise it would be if it's scraping on the ground. There's no reason to unnecessarily pull up on the plow any more than you have to because that gives the plow the best chance to stay in the ground. And then, it doesn't matter what brand of plow I'm pulling, it seems like the tractor hitch always ends up about 10 to 15 inches off the ground when the tractor wheels are out, out of the furrow. And then you can adjust the height of that tractor hitch up and down to get the angle of the plow drawbar just right. And if the tractor needs traction, just add weight. Now, if your shares are sharp, and if you're feeling confident, you could raise the tractor hitch and the plow hitch together to maintain that proper angle of that plow draw bar, which would pull up on the plow more and transfer that force to the tractor wheels for added traction. Now let's look at an improper vertical hitch adjustment. Specifically, the hitch is too flat, which I see often at plow days. Raising the plow draw bar at the plow is usually motivated by something riding the plow out of the ground. It could be worn plowshares with a sled runner behind the cutting point, or it could be brand new shares that are too blunt. As the line of pull becomes flatter, the location of the wheel force shifts forward. Once the wheel force vector reaches the front wheels, there is no more vertical force on the tail wheel. And when it shifts to in front of the wheels, you are actually pulling up on the back of the plow. And remember, as the soil force changes through the field, the orientation of vector SW will change, which will now make the location of the wheel force wildly shift forward and back. This is when you see the back of the plow bobbing up and down. You just can't maintain consistent plowing depth when this happens. So here we are out in the field with a plow draw bar that is too flat. This turned out to be way more subtle than I was hoping for because the shares on this plow are very sharp. Which is good because it makes you look a little harder. You can see the tail wheel and the tail wheel linkage flopping around because there's just not consistent force on the tail wheel. And here's what happens next. The back of the plow is not planted in the ground, so the land sides can't support the plow, and therefore the plow kicks over to the unplowed ground. Can you go too far the other direction? Absolutely. As the plow draw bar becomes steeper, the wheel force will shift to the rear. The plow might appear to run steady, but as the wheel force shifts to the rear, the depth adjustment on the front wheels will have less control over the depth. You will know you've reached this condition when you notice the furrow lever not controlling the depth of the front of the plow. You will raise the furrow lever up, but it just won't let the front of the plow go any deeper. You might also notice the front of the plow lifting up when it hits a hard spot in the field. So let's jump back in the classroom and talk about the horizontal forces on a plow bottom. In the diagram to the left, the soil force vector represents the soil forces in the horizontal plane. The pull force vector represents the pull force, and the land side force vector represents the forces on the land side. The land side force has a friction component and a component that is perpendicular to the direction of travel, which is the portion of the soil force that the pull force does not balance out. This is the force of the land side pushing sideways against the soil. <clears throat> now, there's a math formula that gets repeated for manuals that tells you where the point of resistance, point H, the intersection of the soil force and the land side force, is located relative to the furrow wall. I am not going to repeat that because one of my main points is point H is variable and you need to know how to adjust for it in the field. 
mellow coarse soil will, will move it to the left heavy hard soil will move it to the right slow plowing will move it to the left fast plowing will move it to the right a short moldboard will move it to the left and a long moldboard will move it to the right the pull force will always travel through point H because the plow hitch does not float in the horizontal direction. You'll notice even when pulling directly ahead of point H, there is always a land side force. Pulling directly ahead is ideal, but not always practical, nor is it the end of the world. Think of a single bottom walking plow pulled by a three horse hitch or a single bottom plow behind a bee farm all. The right diagram shows a pull force leading to the left. The land side has to absorb that perpendicular component of the pull force, plus the friction on the land side is increased a little bit. A major point here, the land side force is increased a little, but the land side can handle it. Also, and you can picture this, if the pull force would lead toward the right, the land side force would decrease a little bit. So here we've got a two bottom plow hitched to a tractor. The line of pull is determined by the point H, the point of resistance, and the hitch point. And you want the line of pull to pass a little bit to the right of the center of pull of the tractor. What is the center of pull? The center of pull is the dynamic center of gravity of the tractor. The static center of gravity of a tractor is determined by its construction. For example, I have found the center of gravity on an M Farmall to be about at the clutch housing. Once you hitch a plow to the tractor and pull down on the back of the tractor, the center of gravity becomes the dynamic center of gravity and it shifts to the rear a little bit. If you picked a tractor up and flung it in the air, it would rotate about that center of gravity. We don't want the tractor to rotate, we want it to go straight forward when pulling a plow. So we want the moment, to use an engineering term, or torque, about the center of gravity to be zero. So let's look at all the forces that might create a moment on the tractor. The front wheels have a rolling resistance force to them and they should balance each other out. The rear wheels is where the pulling force comes from and you would think the force on the rear wheels should balance each other out but <clears throat> what do you typically see happen to the land wheel of the tractor? That usually has less traction than the furrow wheel. So that is why we want the line of draft or line of pull to pass a little bit to the right of the center pull of the tractor. So in this diagram, the line of pull is not parallel to the direction of travel. So we're adding a little bit of extra force to the plow land side and a little bit of force to the tractor wheels that's perpendicular to the direction of travel, but this is much more desirable compared to this situation. Here we've got the line of pull too far to the right. The plow is trying to rotate the tractor clockwise, and you can see that in the front of the tractor being pulled to the right. You can also see the plow hitting a hard spot and pulling the front of the tractor over further. We're wasting a bunch of power with the front wheel scuffing like this, and it's just plain no fun for the operator. And here is an example of a wide plow hooked to a narrow tractor. Think of a big plow behind a Wheatland tractor or a semi-mount plow behind a muscle tractor. If you thought you were going to center the hitch point on the tractor, you would make the line of pull pass too far to the right. And if you thought you were going to center the hitch on the plow, you would create this situation. So now we've got the line of pull passing too far to the left. And we can see that in the front of the tractor getting pulled to the left. We can also see as the ground changes, it pulls the tractor harder to the left. And we're just not having very much fun plowing. So let's do some adjusting. Forget where these things are supposed to be located theoretically. In the field, we know we need to get the tractor pointing forward. We have adjusted the hitch point to make the line of pull pass through the right spot in the tractor, all the while keeping the front bottom cutting the right width. And so now the tractor is pointing forward, the tractor looks a lot happier, and the plowman looks a lot happier also.
So let me tie these concepts together. If your plow is pulling crooked, and it's usually pulling towards the unplowed ground, you will not fix that with a horizontal hitch adjustment. It is always a vertical hitch adjustment, or it could be a fundamental problem, such as worn plowshares pushing the plow out of the ground, worn landsides that don't hold the plow, or a tail wheel adjustment. So now that we got the hitch adjustment figured out, it's time to have some fun, turn some ground over, and cover some acres. I hope you learned something, and thanks for watching.